As I was spending time with the Lord uh, this week, just in my own personal Bible reading and so forth, uh, the message that we were in this morning, it was started to take shape. And as I was taking shape, I was making notes, just in my own personal reading, and I'm making notes. And then a verse popped out that didn't really connect with what I was doing, but I started making side notes to that. Um, and so tonight we're going to look at that. Verse number 16 of chapter number 71. I will go in the strength of the Lord, sorry, of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Probably everybody in the United States over the age of six is familiar, at least in part, with Aladdin and his magic lamp. The story has been told and retold in a variety of ways and the, as far as I can tell the number of wishes is always consistent which is three. I don't know if there's some kind of special number I don't know how they settled on three but that is they all seem to have that. We all know about the wishing for more wishes as well and that that's not possible. It is interesting to contemplate exactly what you would wish for. If you had your three wishes, exactly what would you wish for? Now, if you're a far side, how many far side enthusiasts are there in the crowd? Uh, just a few, just a few. How many have no clue about who the far side is? Oh, you poor people. <laughs> the far side, he was just an odd guy, but he has a cartoon where. There's a man on a deserted island out in the middle of this ocean, and he's standing there next to the genie, and he's got the lamp in his hand, and he says, well, okay, I've asked for music, and I've asked for rhythm. Actually, who could ask for anything more? <laughs> You've got to be a far side enthusiast to actually get that. But anyway, we have all contemplated these three wishes. But be that as it may, life doesn't work that way. You're not going to find a magic lamp. You're not going to get three wishes. Even the Christian life doesn't work that way. But in every situation of life, a Christian does have three choices. And tonight, we're going to talk briefly about that. The title is The Christian's Three Choices. So let's pray. Lord, we need you desperately. We can't get there from here unless you take us. But we expect to get there because Jesus Christ already purchased this for us, and it's something we need to understand. So we ask in faith, trusting that your spirit will take us mentally, emotionally, and in our spirit where we need to go tonight. Conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus, who lived all of these words perfectly. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Christian life is not very complicated, actually. We like to make it complicated. Most of the time, we like to think of it as complicated because that makes us feel better when we don't do the right thing. I just couldn't figure it out. It was too complicated, and so I just didn't do the right thing, and so it helps us feel better. But what it boils down to is that in the Christian life, in every situation that you come to, a Christian has three choices. Now, I'm going to give your brain a chance to work tonight. We could, I could just lay this really out real quick, and it would be easy to do so, and you would hear it, and you'd say, okay, and you'd go on. But if I can force, get you to force your brain to come up with the answers, then you'll know it for a lot longer, and it'll be more personal to you. So, you've thought of that, about this. You already have the knowledge in your brain. You maybe have not thought of it in these terms. So, let's take the psalmist's words here in verse number 16. And this verse gives us one of the choices. And then I want you to deduce from your own personal knowledge and your own life experience the other two choices that a Christian has. This, of course, in Psalms 71.16 is the right choice. The other one will be wrong choices. So here we go, verse number 16. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. Okay, there's your one choice. 
what, that's the right choice, what, don't blurt it out, just make your brain come up with it, your brain, not your mouth, what are the other two choices that you have? Using that as your structure, what are the other two choices? Some of I feel like playing Jeopardy music or something right about now. <laughs> How many think I have the other two choices? Okay, we have a few timid souls who, yes, don't, act, don't call on me, but yes, I think I have it. The three choices that we can get from this one choice, if this is the third choice, the right choice, what would the first choice be? Invented to not go, okay? He says, I'm going to go in the strength of the Lord. So the first choice you have is not to go at all. What's the second choice? To go in your own strength. And the third choice is, and the right choice, I will go in the strength of the Lord. In every turn of life, in every problem of life, at every point of growth, these are the three choices that you have to make. One of these three choices is how you will deal with every situation of life. Let me briefly describe them, and then we'll practically apply them and be done. To go, sorry, to not go is to just simply refuse to do whatever God is calling you to do. Refusing to do what you know is right. Each of us here have a will, and it almost always comes into play. There are simply things we don't want to do. And so we don't. That's one choice we make. We're supposed to go, but we just won't go. That is a bad choice. Number two, we can go in our own strength. There are times when we see the wisdom and prudence of what God is calling us to do. It's the right thing to do. We know it. And so we want to do it, but we do it in our own way. We do it in such a way that we keep control of it. Or we get, quote unquote, the credit for doing it. So we set out to do these things, it's the right thing to do, but we set out doing it using our own resources, our own brain power, our own influence, our own system, our own knowledge of human behavior, anything that we have, we use to accomplish this thing. So we go in our own strength. This is, by the way, what the scripture calls leaning, in part, leaning on your own understanding. It is also what the hymn writer wrote, the arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. That's what he's talking about, going, doing the right thing, but with your own strength. The arm of flesh will fail you. You better not trust yours. Going in your own strength has the advantage of making you feel a little bit better about yourself. You don't feel like a Jonah. I'm not running from God. I'm doing what he wants me to do, but the results of it is just as devastating as doing what Jonah did. Human wisdom, psychological tricks, personal influence, smooth words, winning personalities, and anything else that you can do is not enough. And it will not turn out the way that it should long term. So choosing to not go is a bad choice. Choosing to go but in your own strength is a bad choice. The third choice, which is the right choice, is what the psalmist chose, to go in the strength of the Lord. What that does for us is it sets our will aside and does His will. But it also puts the limitations of the flesh aside as well. It recognizes, I am weak. I cannot do this. And allows the power and wisdom of strength of God to work instead. That is the proper choice. I'm going to do what God has called me to do, but I'm going to do it in his strength. So let's run through some real life circumstances here and see if we can't get a handle on this. 
We'll take one that has two sides to it. Let's say a situation occurs in your family. Some bad situation. Who knows what it is? It needs to be dealt with by you. So what do you do? It's a bad situation. It needs to be dealt with by you. And you have three choices. Your first choice is refuse to go. For whatever reason, and there would be lots of reasons, fear, frustration, you don't want to get involved, you just don't do it. I don't want to do that, I'm not going to do it, and so you don't. Or, you see the problem, and so you just run right in and try to fix it yourself. And if you've ever done this, you'll know that most of the time you make the problem ten times worse by doing it. Or, you can take the third choice, is you see the problem, and then you get on your face before God and recognize that you are not capable of dealing with the situation. And you beg God for the right time, the right words, and His Spirit to do the work. You go and handle the situation, but in His strength. This is the right choice. You have three choices, but only one is right. But let's take the same scenario and flip it a little bit. This same, some situation, or maybe the same situation, occurs in your family, but it's not yours to deal with. It's happened, but it's not yours to deal with. God's will for you is to stay out of the situation. You have three choices. You can refuse to stay out of it. You have something that you want to say, and so you jump in and go in direct conflict with God's will. I won't ask how many of you here has done that before, because everybody here would probably raise their hand. It was a situation you should not have gotten involved in, and you knew it, but you jumped in anyway because you had something you wanted to say. Or you recognize, okay, I'm not supposed to be involved with this. So you decide to bite your lip, as they call it. You're going to keep yourself from saying anything because you know that you shouldn't say anything. And so you fight down in your own strength the impulse to get in your two cents worth. How many have ever done that? Let's hear, see a raise of hands. You have tried to bite your lip. I shouldn't say anything, and so I'm not going to say anything, and you bite your lip. Anybody want to say what actually happens? I'll tell you what happens. One of two things. You can't bite your lip hard enough, and the words just come pouring out of your mouth. Or your face shows what you're actually thinking, and so you don't actually have to say anything. And the person on the other side knows exactly what you're thinking without you saying any words. And so you feel all good about, ha, I didn't say anything, but they know what you would have said if you'd opened your mouth. And it's the same thing. You got involved when you should not have gotten involved. Why? Because you tried to stay out of it being involved in your own strength, and it doesn't work. But your third choice is to get on your face again and ask the Lord to help you keep quiet and to ask for him to stay, for the strength to stay out of what doesn't belong to you and then peacefully let those who are supposed to deal with the situation do what they're supposed to do. You let the strength of the Lord keep your mouth shut. You rely on him to remove these things from your heart and live peaceably while others handle the situation. You have three choices, but only one of them is right. A new scenario. You're given an opportunity to minister, and you know that this is something that you are supposed to do. It could be to sing special music or read the Bible up here or preach or teach or one of the thousand other things that take place on this property or the ministries of this church. So you have three choices. You can not go. Say, sorry, there is no way I will not do that. 
I'm not going to do it. Or you can go in your own strength. You just jump right in. I can sing. I can teach. I can do whatever. You look at your strengths and your own weaknesses and your own talents. And using those, you try to do the work of God. I don't care how many people after the service tell you you did a good job. If you do minister in any way, shape, or form in your own strength, it wasn't done the way it should have been done. It's just all there is to it. It's not the way it should have been done. And it cannot be right to be done in your own strength. Very often it creates more problems than it solves. And I don't care how, many, how you feel about it or how everybody said, what everybody said, but human strength, human ability, human talent cannot do the work of God. Or you can do what God has called you to do by once again getting on your face, admitting the inability to affect spiritual growth or change, the inability to do the work of God, and you ask him to do the work through your weakness. You have three choices, but only one of them is right. We'll take one last scenario here. You have an unsaved friend, an unsaved neighbor, an unsaved co-worker, and they need the gospel. And you can say, no way. I am too scared to give them the gospel. I get too tongue-tied to give them the gospel. I don't want them to think that I'm weird, so I'm not going to open my mouth, and you just will not go. That's your choice. I'm not going to go. I know they need the gospel, but I'm just not going to do that. Or... You can learn the four points of the gospel. You can learn some really good illustrations. You can polish your presentation, uh, the, the way you present the gospel. You can get your ability uh, uh, to handle every argument. You can get it all lined up. You can use your winning personality and give the gospel to somebody. Now, these things are really strange. God is so loving that, very, that it is not unusual for him to use a presentation of the gospel by somebody like that to use the truth in someone's life, and they get saved from that. It's not unusual. But just as often, a going and giving the gospel in your own strength, just because you know all of these illustrations and you know all of these things, you use your own personality to give the gospel, just as often, Someone makes a false profession. They pray some prayer, and now they have this unrealistic belief that they're on their way to heaven because they prayed this prayer that you con conned them into praying. Or it's done in such a way that the truth does not cut into because it's not being taught by the Holy Spirit, and it hardens their heart. So the next time someone gives the gospel, it's being given to a heart that's been hardened by your fleshly approach. You're using your own ability. So you have a choice. Just say, I'm not going to give the gospel to anybody, or I'm good enough, I, I've got a good personality, I'm a, a real fast talker. But your third choice is to bathe the, that person in prayer, praying that the Holy Spirit would prepare their heart, praying that he would give you the opening to speak a word for Christ and praying that he would give you the words to speak that you would go in his strength. That's the choice. You have three choices. No. Or I'll go, but I'm going to do it my own way, my own strength. Or I'm going to go in the strength of the Lord. Christian's life is not complicated. It's not a mystery. It's the simply the three choices that we have in everything that we face. We have three choices, but only one of them is right. Make sure that you choose the right choice in everything that you do. Amen. Let's pray.